I'm chosen for today is the Samanasyam Sukta from the Rig Veda. It's, it's a hymn that emphasizes harmony in the family. The crucial word that the Rishi places before us is Saumanas, that is, having a favorable disposition towards one another. All members of the family must love one another. That's the essential theme. The poet has used a very powerful image of a cow and its newborn calf to convey his message. A gentle cow turns very aggressive and protective towards her newborn calf. She would aggressively shake her head if she saw any danger approaching. Immediately upon giving birth to a little one, a cow licks it for hours together to clean it up. These acts are seen by the poet as expressions of love. So, the Rishi says, love one another as a cow loves her newborn. Love needs no reason to be. So, if you love one another, there will be no questions and doubts in your mind about what you are doing and what we are supposed to do. Love will provide all answers. It will give us the strength to face all crisis situations in which others might falter and fall. But then, that is easier said than done. That man is a social animal is only half-truth. Man is also an anti-social animal, full of ego, aggression, selfishness. So how can there be unblemished and unadulterated love? We all have fought with our siblings over trivial things. We have had our differences with our parents. There would be many cousins and relatives of ours who just put us off. You can have genuine differences about your choice of subject, career, late night parties, making friends with this or that person. Many are the occasions for a, for a flare-up. We often hear or read about relationships going so far that people have to resort to violence against their own kin. The Rig Vedic Rishi therefore repeatedly tells us that it is important to think and act together. There has to be unity of mind, unity of purpose, and unity of action. But does unity of mind or uni unity of action necessarily imply imposing one's ideas on another, pushing it down the gullets of the unwilling? Surely not. Because the idea that is supreme in this hymn is the idea of harmony. An imposition, friends, certainly is not conducive to harmony. So unity of ideas and unity of action must mean something else. The Rig Vedic poet is also very much aware of the fact that no individuals can think alike or act alike. But there is a huge contradiction then in his statements. On the one hand, he wants all members of the family to be of one mind and one action, but also knows that it is not possible. Then why set up this utopia? Here the Rishi does what a Rishi is supposed to do. Well, incidentally, on hearing the, Rishi, the word Rishi, you might conjure up an image of an old man with a long white beard sitting somewhere in an isolated spot in the Himalayas and meditating. But that is not the actual meaning of the word Rishi. The word Rishi means the seer, someone who can see beyond. We have devoted here several days to, the, to deliberate upon asking. And one of the issues that we discussed in that concept, context was seeing. Seeing not with our physical eyes, but having the capacity to see beyond what others can see, like a sculptor who can see a beautiful image in a block of rock stone. This needs creativity, some out-of-box thinking, deep introspection, and a deeper understanding of, of each other and life itself. These are the tools that the Rishi employs. Incidentally, let me also say something about the word Kavi, the poet. The word Kavi used in various Indian languages means the same. Kavi and Rishi are synonymous. Kavi hi kranta darshana. One who can see beyond, that is the Kavi, says Yask, the great Indian linguist and etymologist from 700 BC. So the Rishi or the Kavi of the Samanistim Sukta tries to resolve this dilemma. What is the role and status of the individual in a family or a society or a community? Is he subordinate to the community? Should the community always accommodate the individual since he is in a minority? The poet tries to resolve this puzzle by proposing that the individual and the community should not be seen to exist in perpetual adversity. In fact, they cannot be in that state. 
He does so through the image of a wheel, the wonderful image that he's using. A wheel has three essential parts, the outer rim, the spokes, and the axle. Each spoke goes in a different direction. If all the spokes are bunched together, tied together, then there won't be a wheel. But at the same time, each spoke is firmly fixed in the axle. You can't have a wheel if the spoke or even one spoke is detached from the axle. So each spoke is fixed in the middle, but reaches out in different directions. But no spoke can also go beyond the rim. The outer reach of each spoke is determined by the rim. And only when the when spoke, axle and the rim are arranged together in a particular fashion that there is a wheel which moves and which helps the cart or the bicycle to move on. Without this arrangement, the wheel and the cart and everything else will simply collapse. So, we are all free people, with our own likes and dislikes, our own interests and even prejudices. That's how we are. But then our limits are set. We are fixed in some institution, locales, situations, systems, and our outer limits are set by the freedom, likes and dislikes of others. There will be harmony when all of us learn to respect each other, one another's rights, points of view, and are willing to accommodate one another in our lives. It's like a game of tennis the principal often speaks about. The joy of hitting the ball is when it falls within the court. I might want to hit, hit the ball anywhere I want, but then it will not be tennis. Similarly, if I were just want to have my way always, then I have to take the highway. But the question is, why should I surrender my autonomy to others? My answer to that question is, it is entirely up to you. It is entirely up to you upon, upon what you value more. There is no question of imposing our values on you. We are only trying to study various models of social behavior. If you value togetherness, institutional integrity, family, then you will not see accommodation and adjustments as evil as evils. You might even feel happier doing so. But some people think they have the right, or they should have the right to break away from the rim and the axle. But then how will the cart run? So we have to stay fixed within the boundaries. And there is still ample scope for freedom. So our, the, the freedom of the spokes is defined by the axle and the rim. If we wish to run and still detach ourselves from the axle and the rim, then the only alternative that we have is to get attached to another rim and another axle. So if you don't like here, you are free to seek migration to wherever you find love. Join another institution, join another social setup. But I find it unacceptable for some people to say, look, I will join St. Stephen's College, but I will not be bound by the discipline of the college. But what about genuine disagreements then? The Rishi says, talk and discuss. To evolve a common plan of action, you must have a common platform for thinking together. And how do you talk? Leave aggression in the first place. The words, very significant words that echo in the hymn are, Vacham Vadata Bhadraya. Speak words which inspire confidence in others and which all believe to be in their interest. Vacham Vadata Shanti Vam. Speak words which soothe ruffle feathers and bring peace in the minds of all members. Talk to come to a consensus, to arrive at a common understanding about things, not to score brownie points or to let others down, to humiliate or insult them, or to indulge in a never-ending game of blame game, digging up dirt from the past and counting one another's many follies. That can never bring about harmony. Another very significant idea that one finds in this hymn is the idea of staying connected to the roots. Stay close to your elders, jayasvanta. That's the word that occurs in this hymn. Every family or institution is built around a legacy. Elders, seniors represent that legacy. You will appreciate that a family lives as a family only so long as there is a, that it is strongly attached to a common ancestor. When we are with our parents, we are a family. Gradually, we all grow up. Parents pass on to the other world. This leads to loosening of the family ties. And after a generation or two, or in the Indian context, after three, four, five generations, we lose track of who our relatives are. In my childhood, when my grandfather and grandmother were alive, I used to regularly meet several of my grandfathers and grandmothers, brothers, sisters, cousins, 
nephews, nieces, grand nephews, grand nieces. But some years after their departure, we lost all contact. So earlier generations and even their memories act as a strong binding force that keeps a large web of relations together. Our college has a wonderful tradition of observing the Founders' Day on 7th December every year, which is the death anniversary of the Founder Principal, Reverend Samuel Scott Allnut. On that day, we hold a special service and remember by name all our former teachers who have passed into greater glory. Some of those names we don't know, but many of them are names of teachers and colleagues with whom we have interacted, who are right here before us. One cannot, get, one not, one cannot help getting emotional when their names are read out by the principal. This makes us feel a part of the great history of St. Stephen's College. Students who come to St. Stephen's College for three or five years actually cannot fathom what has gone into building this great institution. I often tell my students that St. Stephen's College today is, is a great college not because of us, but because of the many sacrifices made and many achievements earned by earlier generations of teachers, students and karmacharis. I know of teachers and karmacharis for whom college was everything. They gave their sweat and blood to this college. Several years down the line, the reputation of the college will be determined by what we are doing today as teachers and students. So the memories of elders can have a profound impact on our conduct and help in promoting harmony by keeping us on the track. Sharing is another cementing factor. Share each other's joys and sorrows. Share what you have with those who do not have access to those privileges. One of the essential functions of the family, or the, in the Indian context, the larger joint family, was to provide social security to the less advantaged or the disadvantaged, the orphans, widows, the unemployed or the underemployed members, the sick, the old. With the breakdown of the joint family system, we have no alternative mechanisms to take care of these segments. Humility is another virtue that binds us together. If I am arrogant, if I think I am superior in intellect or understanding to others, I will only offend them and create distances. One-upmanship is a sure recipe for disharmony and discord. For no one wants to be belittled or humiliated. I cannot be pontificating to everyone every time. I must also learn to listen. We can now look at this issue from another angle. Some people might say what, what you are talking about is all morality, which is distant, broken from the reality outside. And some analysts would say that the entire superstructure of cultural, social, religious and political institutions, beliefs and practices is, is built on the base of economic structures. We are, or you are indeed growing up in times when the world has opened up, newer and more exciting, more fulfilling opportunities, distances have shrunk, voluntary and partly forced displacement or migration is rampant, so we can no longer be in the midst of a clan or a tribe or a village or an established urban mohalla or a neighborhood or even a joint family. We have lost the protection of that social setup. This is leading to newer kinds of issues from weakened and weakened marriages to broken families, suffering old people, increasing cases of assault on children and old people or a lone couple at home. Life is becoming more and more lonely for a lot of people. All these developments provide an opportunity for rethink and course correction. Some people today are placing too much faith in the state or NGOs or even commercially run organizations, expecting them to take care of all kids and old and infirm and just anyone who needs help. They want the state or private bodies or NGOs to set up institutions like creches or old people's homes or hospitals where the sick can be interned without anyone from home being required to attend to the patient. But this also lets us the opportunity to think about the model of growth and development that we have adopted. It's all economics and no humanity. How can we talk of development only in terms of profits, pay packets and perks? That's a proposition I want to present before you. How can we talk of development only in terms of profits, pay packets and perks? If globalization has brought wonderful opportunity, it has also disturbed the way our society functions. India's model is that you have to take everything together as one inseparable whole. 
There are no compartments or divisions in life. So, social life and family life cannot be divorced from professional life. If you think that harking back to a Vedic sutra or pure and simple morality does not serve the purpose, please think of systemic changes required to restore the sanctity of life in togetherness. Thank you.